How can the study of victims and psychological profiles help us solve serial murder? Stick around and find out on today's Big Brain. Welcome to the Big Brain stream. I am F.P. Eskra, otherwise known as Professor Eskra, and I am here to talk to you about serial killers while playing vampire. And this will be our last talk on this topic for the time being. But this week we will be talking about victims and profiling. I'm sure that those terms come to mind and you immediately think of, you know, TV shows and stuff like that. Well, we're going to try and dispel some myths today. So if that sounds interesting and you want to watch me beat some folks up as a vampire, stick around. A couple kind of headlines that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about victims and specifically victimology. And what victimology is, is before I start running around here as the vampire, what victimology is, is basically criminology, but focused on victims, right? The studying of victims and the demographics of victims and the, the why, how are victims chosen, right? Why do certain people become victims of crimes and certain other people don't? That's kind of what victimology is. And we'll be discussing three different theories. Um, and then we will shift our focus to profiling and talk about the different styles of profiling and its kind of uh, continued use in the investigation, not only just crime, but serial killers. So, there it is. See, the game is like you've been standing still too long. So let's get moving. What I want to do is I kind of want to find a character that I ran into not too long ago. Because as we talk about victims, and we've already discussed a couple times, ah, there she is. We've already discussed a couple times on this program, if you will, uh, the, the demographics of victims, right? Uh, overwhelmingly young females alone, right? And then children, and then hitchhikers, people who are alone at home, hospital patients, store owners, landlords, right? People walk, so it's always these people who are out and alone, right? We've discussed about these demographics. Why is it that those people seem to be the folks? Well, there are three theories that kind of point to that. And as you can see, <laughs> the, the, the lady on stream, uh, by the, the, the little pose that she was doing, I give you three guesses as to what she is. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? So we're going to talk to her. We're going we're gonna to introduce ourselves. Good evening, Christine. Change your mind, Mr. Reed? So, we've already met Christina in, uh, previously. Um, however, we're going to ask about her life in London, right? Uh, uh, about your health. Christina, have you been examined? The epidemic is spreading fast in London. And you could be exposed. Or expose others. I don't like doctors or hospitals. But I don't like you asking questions. Hmm. Uh, and then I say, your line of work has many health risks. Considering your line of work i assure you it is only a matter of time so what is her line of work you may be asking well she is in fact a prostitute which again there's nothing wrong with right uh, i'm not judging and as she just said she needs money it's important she's doing it really to support her family right her kids tell me about yourself let's see if we can get her to, to say it again People don't usually come to see me for conversation. No, they don't. No they come to see her for, for more carnal desires. However, the... The war, exile, and England. This country is not especially welcoming. I have been refused many jobs because of where I am from. I had few options left. I always thought... This I is... I'm going to skip through some of this dialogue because she's she basically hit on exactly what I wanted her to hit on. You know, she's in prostitution. Why is she a prostitute? Well, because she's a refugee who's come to England, which isn't very friendly to foreigners, uh, during a time of war when, you know, tensions are high in foreigners, one, but also kind of, you know, the class disparity is, is widening. She would be right at the top of the list for a serial killer. And as of right now, I'm, I'm a vampire now stalking her, and I understand how that how that looks. But I, I promise you I'm not going to kill her, because, you know, based upon my brief little conversation with Christina, I like her. And is she following this man? Uh, nope, she's getting stuck at the gate. And then she goes. Okay, that was a weird little glitch. Anywho, um, prostitutes, right, right at the top of the list. Why? Well, three victimological theories that we should discuss. The victimological theories, they all surround a concept known as victim facilitation, right? 
And what is victim facilitation? Victim facilitation is the concept that the victim somehow aids the offender in the commission of the crime against them. Okay, we're going to dig through some trash first. I got a spring! Victim facilitation is that the fact that the somehow the victim facilitates the crime, makes the crime easier for the offender to... Uh, blood. Whoever left these marks did so deliberately. Oh, what marks? I don't see marks. Oh, those marks. Okay, well, we're gonna go... Can We, we can't go that way. I feel like maybe he wants us to... To go that way yeah we're gonna go we're gonna we're gonna take the bait um the victim facilitation though and there are three ways that it can happen oh geez stop it Ooh, stop it oh they they left the blood to lure me in well that's rude all right let's do it That's it. We got it. We got to heal a little bit. There we go. Eat him. Ooh, yeah. I hit him good. There we go. It would not be a gaming lecture if it was if there wasn't gameplay. Oh, there's another guy coming. Stop it. I killed all of you. There we go. Do this. And then this should be it. Hmm. Oh, you bastard. You just saw me kill that big brute of a man. And you coming at me like that? Who do you all think you are? Anywho, victimological theory. <laughs> victim facilitations happens one of three ways. I'm going to dive right back into it because I kind of have to. And there is victim precipitation, what they call lifestyle theory, and then what is called the routine activities theory which are the two which are uh, sort of similar but different but we'll get into them Vic we'll start with victim uh, precipitation because it's kind of the easiest when it comes to victim facilitation and victim precipitation comes in two forms it can either be passive or active and we'll start with the easiest active precipitation active precipitation basically means that the victim did something that actively precipitated the crime against them and the best uh, example I can usually give is think about a drunk guy at a bar who, you know, has like the beer muscles and he goes around trying to fight everybody. And he's like, yo, bro, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? And he kind of like this. Well, bro, this guy, this guy would be an active precipitator. Hey, Doc. Well, he likes me now. So, but like, you know, he was, he was an asshole when we met him. He stabbed a guy. Remember that? I do. But... This would be an active precipitator, right? The crime against him of being stabbed was actively precipitated by him. He kind of got into a fight. Passive precipitation, however, is that there is some quality about the victim that just invites people to commit crimes against them. And I kind of laugh because the thing that I, I picture is the scene in... Um, Step Brothers. God damn it, I don't know what it is about your face, but I want to deliver one of these right in your suck hole. Is there anything I can do to work on that? No, so you not wouldn't... really. It's your face. That's kind of what passive precipitation is. It's having a, an inherent quality about you that just invites crime. Now, of course, that's a humorous kind of example. Um, that uh, the There is no, you know, quality about a face that just invites people to go punch it. I mean, maybe there is, right? There are punchable faces out there. That's kind of what passive precipitation is, right? And that's that's just precipitation. Mmm. Give me a little flutter. This is interesting, actually. This is sort of uh, passive precipitation, active precipitation, right? Um, so if we consider Lady Ashbury to be a serial killer, right? Well, she is going to look for a certain inherent quality in her victims. And it seems as though her victims are patients, right? Right at the top of the list again. The inherent uh, quality that she looks for are people who are on death's door, essentially. Right? But that is passive precipitation. It is an inherent quality in the victim themselves. They do not actively precipitate the crime. They have a quality about them that invites the crime upon them. 
Um, now, of course, this is probably getting into the fact that she probably talks to them and then they ask to die and all that nonsense, right? Which kind of can play into a part a little bit. But for the most part, this is a really, really good example of passive precipitation, which is kind of, again, why I chose this game. There's, 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 it's super relevant. So there is a s lifestyle theory and lifestyle theory. I have to kind of put this sort of disclaimer on it because it is the one that sounds the closest to victim blaming or victim shaming. Okay. And now let me just put right out there out front, victim blaming, victim shaming is never okay. But this theory is not a ver form of that. It sounds like it on um, kind of its face, but it is by no means victim blaming, victim shaming. Because what lifestyle theory says is that some people lead a life that puts them into situations that would make it more likely for them to become the victim of a crime than other people do. Uh, and I can give you an example, right? So say that you have two people and say they're both in college, right? They both go to, you know, like a bigger college in a bigger city. Like say like Philly or New York or Pittsburgh or something like that, right? And the one person, they, they basically, they go to class, you know, they go back, they study, um, they hang out with their friends in a dorm room and they don't go out and party. If they do go out and party, they'll, they'll go to kind of like, I don't know, like a, a, just a regular bar or whatnot, right? Like local dive bar or something like that. But they'll always go with their friends and they never drink too much. And they're always kind of okay to walk home, right? A super responsible person. And then you have another person, same school, same city, different lifestyle, though, right? They go out, they, and they go to not just like a regular bar, or regular party, but they go out and find like raves. Like I'm talking about those warehouse raves that are like set up illegally. Um, where like acids being dropped and there's lights and the people who are dancing like oots, 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 oots. that person goes out to those raves and then partakes in those party drugs to the extent that they black out regularly right which one of those is more likely to be assaulted uh, whether it's sexually or just physically or maybe robbed right which one of those is more likely I bet the answer, I mean, the answer is fairly obvious, and I bet you kind of have it in your head. Well, of course, it's the first one. <laughs> it's the second one, right? It is the, it's the guy who's going to go, the guy or girl or whomever, who's going to go out and get blackout drunk or high or whatever at a, at a dangerous raid surrounded by, you know, faceless people. In fact, there are people who, who live that existence and do become victims fairly often. That again is not victim blaming, right? you live your life you do you boo boo but it's kind of the thing that that when it comes to criminals right this is what lifestyle theory says they prefer easy targets and if you live a life that makes you an easy target it just puts you in the position of becoming uh, a victim more than a person who doesn't live that life it doesn't make it okay obviously right if people want to live that life they should be allowed to live that life but the problem is is that criminals don't see it that way they just see you as prey and so it's that's what lifestyle theory says is that why do some people become well it's because they live a life that you know motivated offenders pursue so that's lifestyle theory and then finally the last victim victimological theory that we'll talk about today is what they call routine activities theory Routine activities theory says that crime, and this kind of in line with the rational choice theory of crime, is that crime exists because there are opportune targets, there are motivated offenders, and there are there is a lack of capable guardians. And basically what, again, goes back to kind of what lifestyle theory says and what passive uh, precipitation says, is that criminals like to look for easy targets, right? And so they will look for the opportune target. They will look for, we're gonna leave her for now. Routine activities theory says that when it comes to uh, those three factors, a criminal will look for, must first of all be motivated, right? If they're not motivated to offend, if they don't have a, a desire to offend, or if they don't have a need to, to offend, then, then they're not going to offend, right? or the, the likelihood of them offending is lower. 
then they will look for, if they are motivated to offend, they will look for an opportunistic target, right? A target that is easy to grasp onto, right? Sort of kind of what, what uh, lifestyle theory says. Um, and then there must be a lack of capable guardians. Because if you have a motivated offender and you have an opportunistic target, but you have some somebody or something there that is able to protect that thing, then the crime isn't going to occur. If the um, guardian isn't there, though, then that motivated offender, there's nothing stopping that motivated offender from pursuing that target. And that's what routine activities theory says. So I'll give you an example, right? The person who, you know, walks home from work every Friday um, and stops by the bank and deposits their check, but then always withdraws like $200 from the ATM. So, but they do that every Friday. That's an opportunistic target. If there is a motivated offender who wants to, you know, steal an easy 200 bucks, that's a good target. Uh, then there must be a lack of a capable guardian. Well, where are they walking? Are they walking in like a downtown area where there's a high police presence? Or are they walking kind of on the outskirts of town where the police aren't present and there's no cameras? Lack of capable guardians, that's where the crime's going to occur. That's how those theories work. Uh, that's how serial killers work. So these theories can help explain why certain victims are chosen over others, right? Why you are more likely to see a young woman alone and children and, and travelers being targeted by serial killers over maybe groups of men, right? Or uh, why the elderly will be targeted over young, healthy individuals. Pick a, pick a victimological theory and they will help explain the choice of target. Now, um, let's take a hot second and choose what we're going to upgrade. Like, this is like a vampire thing, right? You like move fast and you jump. That's only five points. Yeah, sure, why not? Done. Let's do this one too. This sounds fun. It's like blood bending, like the avatar. And then we gotta, we have to upgrade some of the health things. We're gonna do some of this. go there we go i want the the heel biting because the heel biting is great good yeah all right cool that's uh we'll confirm that shit well hello i've interrupted this video in order to ask you to please like subscribe leave a comment about what topic you want me to talk about and what game you want me to play uh helps the channel out helps these videos but for now back to the video so that's victims. That's victimology. The victimological theories. That's it. I mean, it's essentially it's it's which who's the easy target? Who's the easy pickings? Because really, when it comes sort of right down to it, uh, criminals and serial killers are just like predators out in the kind of animal kingdom. They will pick on the sick. They will pick on the weak. Um, they don't want to go after the bull alpha male. They want to go after that mm, tiny little sick one, right? That that's on the edge, that everybody kind of left behind. Uh, because they can pluck them from the crowd and uh, nobody will notice. That's victimology. All right, so let's move on. Um, this is going to be, we're going to move on to our, our second big topic, second, second big umbrella topic for the night, and that is profiling. Now you hear profiling, right? And you're like, listen, that's that's where, where the really attractive people on the TVs, you know, solve the crimes and they're the FBI people, right? I've seen Criminal Minds. <laughs> yes, that is supposed to be profiling um it is a glamorized hollywood version of profiling but it is supposed to be profiling the problem with that is a problem that is shared amongst shared by most criminologists and that is an effect called the csi effect the csi effect is basically what the show csi did to the you know criminal investigator and the prosecutor and the police officer and the detective and all that right lay people such as you or i um who like to watch that tv that that, that sort of garbage tv right um that is just like police dramas and serials and stuff they're entertaining as shit law and order was my jam when i was a kid um still is right a little law and order it gets so many things wrong though all of these shows do but the problem is, is that the vast majority of the public watches that TV and says, well, it's on TV, so it must be how it is in real life. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> the problem is, is that that effect holds true. And then those people who watch those shows then go to, to trial as jury members 
and those presumptions about the way that investigations should take place affect their decisions on whether or not a person is guilty or not. And so detectives and police officers and, and investigators and criminologists are held to like an unrealistic Hollywood-like standard. It's not that it's fraudulent, right? Because it's for entertainment. And I mean, it's slated as entertainment, but people need to accept it as entertainment. Profiling, however, is useful, right? Maybe it's not done exactly how it's shown on TV, but it is done. And, but it is a broader concept than what the TV would have you believe. What shows like Criminal Minds and that want you to believe pr profiling is, is strictly psychological profiling, which is just one facet of profiling, okay? Um, and also they do it in kind of like a ridiculous way. Uh, they pull shit out their ass all the time. Profiling is not without its faults and profiling has its fair share of this this guy was yelling and he distracted me <laughs> profiling has its fair share of detractors as well of people who, who you know have criticisms of it and they are valid criticisms and we'll get into those in a second but let's just kind of do an overview right what is profile what are the different types of profile generally speaking what profiling is supposed to do is taking the scientific process, right, and being able to identify common factors amongst crime, uh, crimes, criminals, and victims, and trying to relate them so that you can kind of create a stereotype, right? Because that's the way our brain works. Our brain creates stereotypes, where you take these things, these commonalities, and put them into a nice, neatly defined box and say, this will always see these things, right? If you see these things together, you're looking at this. Racial profiling is actually a really good example of stereotypes, right? Um, think, think, think of any racial stereotype that you can have. That's Your brain does that naturally. Now, of course, culture has kind of influenced those, right? Uh, the, the Western culture, um, specifically American culture, has really influenced. This isn't about race and ethnic relations. However, it's the same way, except we're trying to do it scientifically to try to solve crime. Uh, that's what profiling tries to do. Now, what commonalities you look for will define the type of profiling that you are doing. The places you look for these commonalities uh, come in four different phases of crime. The antecedent phase, the method and manner phase, the body disposal phase, and the post-offense behavior. So there's these four phases to crime. And antecedent is before the crime. The method and manner looks at the victim, the way they were killed, what was done during the crime. Body disposal is obviously what happens in the body. Do they leave it? Do they take it somewhere? Do, do they eat it? I don't know. <laughs> then post-defense behavior is, okay, what happens after that? Do they then, you know, dwell on that fantasy? Do they... Uh, just kind of leave it uh, and then just go back to their lives that these are the areas that we're looking at the different types of profiling we will start with offender profiling and offender profiling law enforcement agencies collect data often using case studies or anecdotal information which then are transformed into general descriptions of the types of person most commonly associated with a certain type of criminal activity and on its face it sounds like racial profiling and it's really hard to argue that it isn't, but you can describe qualities of a person without mentioning their race. Um, and so this looks at socioeconomic status. This looks at education level. This looks at, we're gonna poof up there. That way I can avoid these people. You can go this way. Poof. Can I poof that way? I'm gonna poof that way. I can. Oh, being a vampire is awesome. Whoop, 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 whoop. I think I need to kill this guy. I think. Hopefully. Hopefully I. Well, no, not hopefully I have to kill. This is what a serial killer does. Whoop! He sees me. Alright. I'm going. See you, buddy. Poof. Where do I have to go? Oh, it is. It's literally right there. I am gonna have to kill those people. Oh boy, here I go killing again. Just do this. We're going to have to get into a fight and then I will move on with profiling. I'll 
be this man now. Ooh, Jesus. Screw you, buddy. Hey. Oh, look at that. That's cool. <laughs> I like froze him. There we go. That was nice. That was nice. See, now now we're growing into our own. We're becoming more powerful. Our methods are improving. Much like serial killers. Offender profile, right? Okay, so we'll use the vampire as an example of offender profiling, right? Vampires, describe them. Pale skin, usually well-educated, very well-spoken, right? Uh, they have jobs that are usually professional in nature, a uh, higher socioeconomic status, higher education level, come from wealthier families. That's the stuff you can look at to perform an offender profile. Um, it Now, of course, in there, sometimes race gets into it. As long as it is not the only factor that is being used, then it isn't a problem. If it is the only factor being used, then, of course, offender profiling can truly be Kind of terrible. All right. Um, feel like I'm going to fight a boss here. Oh, somebody needs help. It looks like we're going to help this person first. We have to We have to save the lady, right? We have to. Because we are a good vampire. Stop it. We will save her. Oh, look, she, look at the hat she's wearing. She's adorable. Offender profiling. We've done enough on that. Victim profiling. Kind of does the same thing that we just did with regards to victims. And as we've kind of been doing, as we've kind of been doing all class or all series, you look at the demographics, right? And certain victims will be preferred by certain offenders um, and once you kind of start to notice that then you can start creating a profile right for instance oh, this is creepy but i'm gonna steal from this oh jesus if you're noticing right as an investigator that uh a lot of young females alone are going missing well then it's probably going to be a male offender that you're looking for. If, however, a, a bunch of victims are married men and they all have uh, the same wife in common, well, it's probably that wife, right? Because that seems to be um, one of the profiles. Or if it's children. If children are being murdered, overwhelmingly, it is usually a woman that is then the killer. That is how victim profiling works. Now, with victim profiling, however, we can get into kind of one of the regular criticisms of profiling is that often profiling can be very wrong. Stop it. In the sense that, okay, I just said, if you notice that children are the ones that are going missing or, or being killed, well, then it's probably a, a woman. Well, if you remember Wayne Williams, that first kind of famous serial killer was a man. And who were his victims? Children. They were all children. Jesus, that guy gave me some trouble. That's one common criticism with profiling, is that the profile can be wrong. And there are quite a few times in which the profile is wrong. because, And what it can do is it can lead investigators down the wrong path because then what happens is they start only looking for evidence that fits the profile. There are a couple other uh, types of profiling out there, right? Um, DNA profiling, crime scene profiling, where you focus on the ge you focus on the geography of the crime scene, right? Where the crimes take place. Um, geographical profiling is, is its own separate thing as well. Psychological profiling, the type of profiling that's portrayed on TV. But they all essentially follow the same pattern, and they have the same criticisms. So the book that I'm using, right, Serial Murders and Their Victims, uh, by Eric W. Hickey. He actually has, the author of this book actually has, puts his own story in there. The profile of multiple murders in, like, his hometown. Um, 
if you looked at the 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 evidence of the crime scene matched with a profile that was given to the investigators they were looking for multiple men a woman her daughter and her daughter's friend were murdered fairly brutally uh, in a park and the physical evidence um sort of matched with these a group of three men who were in the area at the time and there was uh, a profile was given that it had to be a group of men so that's what the investigators focused on well the author himself uh i guess went on the media and was like that's these three didn't do it looking at you know their prior histories um you know who they are as people based upon my interviews and my assessment these three men didn't do it we are looking for a solo individual he goes we're looking for a solo individual and like a couple weeks later on these three men have now been taken into custody and another body drops and a person comes forward um saying that you know i killed this person and i also killed those three girls in the park and the author was right his profile matched the offender and it's not the only time it's happened criminal suspect told the investigators the man they were looking for came from a broken home was a high school dropout held a marginal job hung out in honky-tonk bars and lived far from the scene of the crime but the actual attacker when he was caught um he did not come from a broken home he had a college degree held an executive position with a respected financial institution uh did not use alcohol and lived near the scene of the crime so like how can profiles get it so wrong and the reason is is because it's a soft science all social sciences are um all of this studying serial killers studying criminals central park five is also a really good example of profiling gone wrong that was victim profiling and offender profiling gone wrong because they were looking for what they believed to be a particular demographic of offender um when and what happens is they lock into that offender and the investigation gets led astray and the real suspect or the real offender gets away that being said even with its criticisms criminal profiling does work it, it has worked and it continues to work and we've also learned a lot more about it in the past 20 years um since like the central park five or since the stories that i've just told you and so that's uh, profiling is worth pursuing right remember once upon a time forensics was that wonky new way of investigating crimes that nobody trusted and now it's like a staple Profiling, psychological profiling, criminal profiling, offender profiling, victimological profiling, all that will be the mainstay and give it another 30 years. Uh, I would say even now it's, it's used fairly often. And as a cutscene plays, that's going to be it for the big brain today. And as we watch a funeral, as the, the, the time of this, the, the life of this lovely lady comes to an end, so does our time with serial killers with the big brain. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, on this lovely lovely stream that i do uh and once this ends i'm going to do my little wrap-ups and uh i'll be able to let those of them in the class that don't need to hang out anymore and go and with that thank you for joining us here on the big brain stream i'm going to take a little bit of a break now for maybe a week or two um, but the videos will be back i promise you so keep an eye out uh, please like, subscribe, leave a comment on the next topic that you want me to talk about in the next game that you want me to play. And maybe I'll be able to play it for you. Uh, but other than that, thank you for attending. I'll see you next time.